Hey, folks, my guest today is Abhilasha Parwar. She's a Fulbright Scholar, Yale alum, having 10 plus years of work experience in private equity, big data analytics, product development, and environmental policy. She's now building blueskyhq.in, which is helping uh, large brands play in the uh, data set space using satellite data and AI. Abhilasha, are you ready to take us to the top? Yeah, sure. Let's go for it. All right. So this is sort of a big idea here. You have some good examples on your website about forest fires in India and quantifying those. Help me understand what you're building. Um, so we take satellite data, large volumes of it, about 30 terabytes plus and ground sensors. And we use this data to give more spatial and temporal resolution. So for instance, the forest fires that we have in India, you have in California, uh, Siberia, Spain, Greece, everywhere on the planet. And we just don't know how much fires is happening, how much are the greenhouse gas emissions. And all of this information is needed by electric utilities for planning for future, by climate insurance, by like banks and everybody for like making decisions, especially as we have the frequency of forest fires or any extreme climate events rise up in the coming 10 years. And who are the buyers of Alasha? Are these governments? Um, no, so it's majorly infrastructure companies because they have to take care of all of this large infrastructure that is like, you know, supporting our life in the face of climate change and it's insurances and investment firms. So, so okay, got it. So insurance, investment firms, when you say infrastructure companies, can you name one or two real ones? Electric utilities, for instance, you know, if you're an electric utility, you face forest fires, you also face the danger of your infrastructure causing forest fires. So it's like a very, very important thing, you know, uh, I mean, even like, for instance, home insurances uh, in the year 2021, the forest fires in California affected 40 times more houses than the last 10 years of fires combined. So you really see how this problem is growing exponentially. And then there's a lot of greenhouse gas emissions that come from forest fires. And the other thing is with blue sky, we don't just focus on forest fires. We focus on all environmental data, whether it's air pollution, water pollution, carbon emissions from industries, carbon emissions from forest fires, the whole spectrum of environment and climate data. Interesting. Abhilasha. And, and so what might an electric company pay you per month or per year to access your data set or your software? Um, so our data sets go anywhere from like $10,000 to like a million dollars, depending on the resolution. For instance, if you want something with one kilometer square resolution, it's cheap. But if you want something with like, you know, 100 meter resolution, it's expensive. Okay. And so uh, it's $10,000 a month or a year? Uh, a year. It can go okay. anywhere from 10 grand a year to, uh, to like a million a year. What would you, I understand there's a massive range here, but what would you say the sweet spot is? Is 10,000 bucks a year a good average? Um, see, we, I really can't say the sweet spot because it depends on resolution, right? Well, no, so I get that. But if you take all your customers, all your revenue divided by all your customers, you can get an average. Um, right? I think it would be good to say that we do hundred K a year. Is, is it good? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And if someone's paying you hundred K a year, what resolution are they probably getting? Is that like 10 kilometers, 50? No, 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 no. You get more resolution with that. You get like okay. 300 dollars, 400 Got it. Dollars. Yeah. Got it. It also and really depends on what is the data set, right? For instance, if I'm doing like water pollution monitoring, it's very complex monitoring. So it's more expensive. Air quality is cheaper because it's like cheaper modeling. The science or the engineering that's needed behind both of these models is like different. Interesting. Okay. Got it. So, so, um, and are these people, are, are they paying for a one time data set, a snapshot, or are they truly recurring? No, so our data set is not static, it's dynamic. So once we deploy our algorithms on the cloud, that data set is being generated at a temporal frequency of that particular category. So it could be daily, it could be once in two days, it could be weekly. Usually our frequencies, temporal frequencies for everything is less than once a week. So uh, sorry, I see. yeah, you get like either daily or once in two or three days. I see. Give me more of the backstory here. This is fascinating. When did you write the first line of code for this? So we started in January, 2019. We're going to finish three years. Uh, we started in my living room, actually, just there. And <laughs> me and my brother and two of our first engineers, and we were all literally operating out of my savings because I used to work at a private equity firm in Connecticut before this. So we were just, you know, ch chilling on a computer table, eating pizzas and writing code. And we got interested in satellite data because, you know, it's growing very exponentially, both the number of satellites that are going in the orbit and the resolutions that they capture. It's same to our iPhones, you know, 
the resolution, you can now zoom your iPhones by like 6x. This wasn't happening like five years ago. And that's the same thing with satellites. So we are able to get snapshots of Earth all the time for different locations, for different parameters. And we clean that data, crunch that data, make sense of all of this huge volume of the data that comes down. And we put it for climate action because we really need to know what's happening on our planet to be able to save our planet. And Abhilasha, did you and your brother split equity 50-50 on day one or who kept more? No, I think uh, I think we are like one. Uh, so it's just basic rules of founders that there has to be one final decision point. So you never split equity 50-50. One person takes more majority and the other person takes less. All right. So how much did you take? I think I took the majority, but then we flipped last year because uh, my brother initially started as like, oh, I'm going to help you for two months. And then he was like, oh, this is so exciting. And there's AI and cloud and APIs. And this is so tech. So he's my seat here. And he's like, okay, so this is a technology company. And I think we flipped uh, flipped our equities last year. So he's the majority shareholder now. Uh, got it. So you just sort of issued him more options, one year cliff for your vesting. And now He's a little more. Well, we are founders, right? So for founders, it's different because your brother and sister, we just like, it's like, hey, you just take like 10% more. Are you guys the only, have you raised capital or do you bootstrap? Yeah, no, we raised capital. We raised a seed round last year for about 1.2 million. And we have gotten a lot of grants and a lot of prizes, like AI innovation prizes, which took us up to like, I think $800,000 or something. Yeah. Uh huh. And so when you did the raise last year for 1.2 million, did you do it on a safe or a price round? We did a price round. Oh, oh, right out of the gate. Why'd you make that decision? Um, I think, uh, you know, it depends on different markets. In the US market, you can do 1.2 million of safe. But in the Indian market, you know, it's not that easy. Like usually the rounds get priced. Also first time founder problems. Like, you know, we don't know. You don't know better. Somebody's coming like, oh, I'm going to invest a million. It's like for climate <laughs> change. Oh yeah. my God. <laughs> yeah. You know, started, so people what, were like, oh, you should start what, a nonprofit. You know? So uh, the valuation is totally depends on your ability to tell a great story and sell the vision. So what valuation did you end up raising at? I think it's something around 7 million. I okay. have to look at it again. Yeah. Okay. And any plans to raise now or you can stay bootstrap for a while? You can stay capital efficient for a while. So we are capital efficient because we are like, you know, um, we are, we are just a tech company of about 20 people completely remote. So mostly it's engineering and data talent, but we are planning to raise more capital and actually flip to Netherlands because it's a very exciting domain for like space data and like climate change. So we are looking to raise about five to $6 million more and just flip it over the, you know, in the next year beginning. Tell me a little bit more about customer growth. Tell me, how'd you get your first customer? Oh my God. So we initially made the data set and we thought that nobody would care about it, like nobody. And then the largest mobile company in India was like, oh my God, can we take your data and integrate it with like millions of mobile phones in India? And that was so exciting because, you know, we literally spent first seven months listening to people telling us, hey, air pollution, that should be done by governments or nonprofits. This is the army, by the way. Yeah, that is Xiaomi. Yeah. So they took our data and like, you know, our APIs, the hits went from 10,000 to like a million, like overnight. Also our API gateway broke because we didn't imagine that much amount of like customers, that much amount of users taking interest in environmental data. Even today, the idea that Nathan would want to know how much is water in the reservoirs in the town that he lives in is very bizarre. People are like, oh, Abby, no one's going to pay for it. But I really feel that as the years go by, like, three years, four years, five years later, climate data is going to be extremely valuable. Yeah. I mean, you're seeing this in California right now. I mean, it's insane. Um, okay. So that's how I got your first customer, that that big telecom company. How many customers are you working with now today? I think we have about eight to 10 customers now, different sizes, different now. I'm not even a sales team anymore. So I do not know much of information. Yeah. No, you're good. So can I take like eight times a hundred thousand dollar average ACV? You guys are doing about 800,000 bucks in terms of run rate right now. Um, I don't, I think you should, I think you would have to go down a little lesser because it depends. Some customers are nonprofits and they're not that like, they don't pay that high. We give them high, huge amount of subsidies. I see. I see. Are you guys past a half a million in ARR at this point? Do you know? Uh, no, no. You can you break it this year? Uh, probably. So the, in India, our cycle is in March, March of 2021. Okay. So our, the, the financial cycle is not January to January, March to March. So I, we have six months left to go. I see. So do you think over the next six months, you can break a, mil, a half million run rate? That is what you're hoping. We're really, really trying very hard for it. We have okay. some like really 
customers that we're trying to work with right now. So like your big name clients, essentially, you know, and if we are able to crack one of them, then we will cross half a million. Mm-hmm. When I look at your website, I look at your customer logos. I, like, I just feel like you guys would have customers that are like, I mean, didn't you say you had customers that were paying like a million per year for data set? There are customers, there are data sets that we are pitching for a million per year to different data, different customers. But, but none have are closed. Yeah. Oh, I see. Got it. Okay. I'm just saying, yeah, because you bill off a number of API hits. You have very good utility-based like upsell metric because it's based off resolution on, on kilo- kilometers. I mean, I feel like you guys should be closing enterprise deals like crazy, right? So we are really so one of the things is that we are trying to get more expansion in the US and Europe because that's where most of our customer base comes from. At the moment, we are a small team, only three people, two people in New York and one in Netherlands. So we will be expanding out and placing more people in these geographies in the next two to three months. Yeah. Wait, sorry, I thought you said you had, you had 20 people fully remote. 20 people fully remote out of it. 17 is in India and three is outside of India. So we have two in New York and one in Netherlands. I see, but they're full, everyone's full time. Yeah, no, everyone's full time. Yeah. I see, I see, I see. Okay, cool. So how are you, I mean, with that many employees and you're still early on the revenue side, how are you managing burn right now? Um, so one of the things is that when you're, you know, I think between America, Europe, and India, the cop capital is very different. So for instance, in India, you can get like a lot of talent. You can also live a very high standard of living at a much different cost, actually. So the cost of running a startup like us in the US and New York would probably like 10 million a year. But for cost of running a startup like us here is about a million a year. So what are your total headcount expenses per month right now? Um, I don't know. I don't think I can also reveal this information to you. Yeah. Why not? I think it's like a little more confidential, right? Like, well, not, I'm not asking for what you pay yourself or an individual employee, but generally speaking, the show is really about helping SaaS founders. And if there's clear arbitrage on developer talent in Pune or Bangalore, et cetera, you know, there is, there is, a, there is a huge arbitrage on the developer talent. Like for instance, we, I would say, let's say $30,000 is some like, you know, you can get really, really good senior engineer. You can get yeah. senior engineers who are like coding amazing stuff for 30 grand. You get nothing in the U S for 30 grand. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. So 20 on the team, how many are engineers? I think we have about like eight team in the engineer, eight people in engineering team, five in the data team, and then rest is like you know the all the other teams. I see. And then why did you you mentioned you're not doing sales anymore? Most founders like that you know you hear general advices you know the founder should really do the first million dollars of sales. Why did you stop doing no, sales? I I focus a lot on the marquee client, so I chase after one client, and rest of the team chases after all the clients. Like I go very much like I'm gonna close like one big name like Morgan Stanley right now in the next six months. So mm-hmm. I have like some like, you know, individual one big client that I'm chasing after right now. I see. What gave you the, it sounds like you came from a private equity firm in up in Connecticut or the Northeast. What gave you the confidence to leave that? I imagine it was probably a cushy job, cushy salary. What gave you the confidence to leave that and start this? Um, well, actually, uh, you know, I think over time it was, you know, my boss was very, very encouraging. He was like, just go for it. If you fail, then just come back and join it again. Which <laughs> so, firm you know, were you with? I was in uh, a firm called Golden Capital based out of Stamford, Connecticut. I see. Interesting. Okay. Was it cushy or they weren't paying you enough? So it was easy to quit. No, it was pretty cushy. Actually, yeah. the other thing, I was really interested in doing a PhD in economics on climate change induced financial depression. And I was working with uh, Professor Gary Gordon in Yale. So I'm a Yale uh, graduate uh, in the master's program. And I really, really wanted to do that because I was obsessed with the Great Depression in the like in the early 1930s. And I really saw a parallel coming in 2020s. So that was like my whole thesis. And then instead of doing that PhD, my professor was like, well, you know, this is a good company because climate risk is going to be a very big sector for a private company. Why don't you go that? And if it doesn't work out, you can always do a PhD. So I had like, you know, a PhD in Yale, a good job in private equity as like backup. So I, you know, also coming back and working with my brother has been so much fun. I think it was the best call ever. I love that. Okay. Let's wrap up, Abby, here with the famous, your uh, famous five. Number one, what's your favorite book? My favorite book. Um, oh my gosh. I love this book called The Worldly Philosopher by, I'm forgetting his name. But he's a, it's a book about a bunch of economists and how they thought about the world. Number two, is there a CEO you're following or studying? Oh yeah, <laughs> lots of CEOs. But I do really like the guts of Elon Musk. I mean, I do not completely follow him. I'm not a fan, but I really 
love the fact he takes a problem which is so fucking impossible i'm sorry for my french so possible so impossible and you know climate change is the most impossible and the most difficult problem so seeing him go head to head with everybody saying you're going to fail is something which does give a lot of courage number 3 what's your favorite online tool for building blue sky notion 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 guys if you're not using notion if you're on google drive please come to notion google did drive. you switch Yes, completely. Like, you know, uh, in 2019, my brother was convincing me to join Notion. He was one of the first 100 users or something. And I was like, "No, no, no, I can't use this tool or something. Like, I'm going to do Google Drive." And we had a big fight also, but now now I'm the biggest proponent of Notion on like Twitter and every platform. I love yeah. that. Number 4, how many hours of sleep do you get every night? I take 8 hours of beauty sleep, man. The girl's going to sleep. I love that. And what's your situation? Married single? Kids. Married What? single kiddos? Uh, I was single for the last 4 years which was a very very bad side effect of being a founder. I was kind of annoying but I recently started dating actually my first crush from 2008 so it's kind very of very so cool. Fun. But not married yet. <laughs> no. Okay, no kids, right? No. Okay. And how, can I ask Abby? Like my mom. <laughs> <laughs> can I can I I'm not saying go have kids. I'm just curious. Um and yeah. Abby can I ask how old how old are you? I'm 31. 31. Last question. What's something you wish you knew when you were 20? What's something I wish in my 20s? Oh my god. Uh I wish uh actually I don't. I think my 20s are pretty good. It's not something you would change. It's just something you wish you knew. It's not a regret. Something um I wish I had gotten on the path of software development just a few years earlier. Uh it was something I was just mildly scared of even though i had so many friends around me who were doing it and even though i myself was like you know a computer i used to code when i was 17 years old actually and i got like really good grades in computer science but i don't know why i stopped doing it i don't know why i stopped doing it uh but it's been super exciting to pick it back Yeah. Guys, there you have it. BlueSkyHQ.in. Their customers are electric utilities, insurance companies, and infrastructure companies who pay them for data, satellite data. They upsell based off the resolution, based off kilometers. Uh, they have customers paying uh, as little as called a hundred grand a year, chasing million dollar a year deals as well. They just passed eight paying customers and called about a half million dollar run rate, hoping to break five hundred thousand dollars in terms of run rate in the next six months. They look to scale, raised one point two million dollars last year at around a seven million dollar valuation. Uh, a a a, 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 a Abi and her brother team brother sister team working together growing this bad boy we'll see what happens next abi thanks for taking us to the top thanks so much have a good one nathan one more thing before you go we have a brand new show every thursday at 1 p.m. central it's called shark tank for saas we call it deal or bust one founder comes on three hungry buyers they try and do a deal live and the founder shares back end dashboards their expenses their revenue ARPU, CAC, LTV, you name it, they share it. And the buyers try and make a deal live. It is fun to watch every Thursday, 1 p.m. Central. Additionally, remember, these recorded founder interviews go live. We release them here on YouTube every day at 2 p.m. Central. To make sure you don't miss any of that, make sure you click the subscribe button below here on YouTube, the big red button, and then click the little bell notification to make sure you get notifications when we do go live. I wouldn't want you to miss breaking news in the SaaS world, whether it's an acquisition, a big fundraise, a big sale, a big profitability statement or something else. I don't want you to miss it. Additionally, if you want to take this conversation deeper and further, we have by far the largest private Slack community for B2B SaaS founders. You want to get in there. We've probably talked about your tool if you're running a company or your firm if you're investing. You can go in there and quickly search and see what people are saying. Sign up for that at nathanlacka.com. forward slash slack. In the meantime, I'm hanging out with you here on YouTube. I'll be in the comments for the next 30 minutes. Feel free to let me know what you thought about this episode. And if you enjoyed it, click the thumbs up. We get a lot of haters that are mad at how aggressive I am on these shows, but I do it so that we can all learn. We have to counter those people. We got to push them away. Click the thumbs up below to counter them and know that I appreciate your guys' support. All right, I'll be in the comments. See ya.